and uh, this is a relatively short period of time. So I'm gonna try to get through this quickly and try to cover a lot of ground, not go down too many rabbit holes and also not speak too quickly so that I you know, feel like we're all rushed. Um, my name is Evan Wyloge. Um, unlike I think a lot of people at this conference, I am a journalist, not primarily a cartographer, um, but I am um, a practitioner of data journalism, which a lot of times overlaps into doing things with maps and mapping, um, GIS work, and it's a lot of fun. And uh, in addition to doing it, I also get to teach it, which is also a lot of fun. Um, it's kind of a growing subfield within journalism, and it's really exciting. Um, so if you want to be tuned in to me and what I'm all about and see re weird random tweets about data journalism stuff or other random things, uh, you can follow me there on Twitter. And I've also got the link right here to this presentation. And there will be a couple other links uh, in the presentation. All right. So. November 8th, 2018. Does everybody remember what happened? Where this was? California, yep. Paradise. Paradise, California. Um, pretty terrible fire. And afterward, some pretty stark images were, um, were coming out of there and it was, it was pretty apparent that this was a, a real disaster. These are some of the images I think that really gripped me and some others. Um, basically we saw people die in their cars while they were trying to get out. Um, how did this happen? Well, there were some conditions that were really bad, uh, for the city of paradise. Um, you know, basically where the fire started, what the direction of the wind was, and also, you know, the, the layout of the city and the way that the roads were set up. Um, because of the embers that were flying off of the fire, the main part of the fire, um, there were several roads that got blocked. Um, and, you know, that's, that's where we saw some of those fatalities of people in, in their vehicles. This is a great graphic from the LA Times. I didn't have anything to do with it, but it was a good example. Um, so these days in the media world, uh, there's a lot of partnerships happening. Um, it's a way for our industry, which is, you know, in kind of a slow, long decline um, to, you know, get together and, and work together on projects and do things that we feel are really important and that we may not be able to pull off on our own. So in the wake of the Paradise Fire, uh, three organizations got together, um, AP, Gannett, McClatchy, to work together on what we call the California Fire Risk Project. Uh, we called it, uh, what did we call it? Next to burn? No, we called it destined to burn. Next to burn was another project we were uh, involved with. So uh, destined to burn, and we put together a handful of stories uh, kind of as a package. And I want to say there were about five or six stories. And um, I was focused on one in particular, which was uh, evaluating egress routes uh, throughout California for people who live in the highest risk areas. Um, so what this required was combining a few different data sets and maps. Um, and I was also quite confused about how to do this at first and thought of some a few ideas. Um, and I'm gonna come back to this at the end. Uh, but some of the ideas that we, that we had considered but didn't pursue were uh, trying to use satellite imagery to do some sort of visual analysis on, on the uh, roads in California. Uh, and I did some, I did a little bit of testing of that and it turned out that that was very time and energy intensive. Uh, and then there were also problems where roads were obscured uh, by trees or a variety of other things that just made it hard to actually see the roads themselves. Um, it, this also probably would have required a bunch of machine learning, uh, which would have required <laughs> a bunch of Evan learning on my part, um, which I did not have time for. Uh, I think one of the things that is uh, both exciting but also distressing <laughs> and anxiety producing when you're working in data journalism is you're being asked to take on these big tasks and a lot of times you have to figure out how to do it and you have a deadline. Um, so uh, 
it occurred to me that if only there were some sort of uh, open source street maps, maybe I could figure out how to um, use that to accomplish what I needed to do. All right. So this is kind of a condensed version of like a methodology for what I ended up doing. Uh, I can walk through it just real quick. And if any part of it, like you want me to stop or you have a question, please just uh, yell out. Basically, I started with uh, California's 700,000 census blocks, turned them into centroids, joined those to the fire risk map, which is called the FHSZ. That's the uh, fire hazard severity zone maps maintained by CAL FIRE. Uh, specifically, we were looking at the very high risk areas, um, took those centroids once they were joined with that data, aggregated those to zip codes. And there was a reason that we did zip codes, uh, ZTCAs, uh, what does ZTCA stand for again? Somebody knows this in this room. Z zip code tabulation, k -k 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 something area. Um, but because zip codes are actually not geographies, right? They're actually like some other categorization that doesn't truly have like a spatial thing, but ZTCAs are. Anyway, uh, the reason that we went with ZTCAs or zip codes is because um, who in here knows what census tract they live in? Not even one person in this room? <laughs> this would be the room where somebody would know what census tract they live in. Okay, but who in here knows what zip code they live in? All right, see? So for emergency planning, it turns out that zip codes are a pretty useful uh, unit of measurement. Uh, and we talked to some experts who told us that, and that made a lot of sense to me. Um, also, like census tracts, they're relatively-ish the same size. I mean, there's, there's a lot of variety in them, but they're, you know, they're a lot more like each other than, you know, say, municipalities, um, which is and this is a small digression, but part of this collaboration, they tried to do a similar analysis where they were just looking at population and the fire risk, and they were using municipalities, which I thought was just like the wrong unit of measurement to be using, because if you live on the edge of LA, you are in a very different situation than if you live in the interior of LA. And so I just didn't think that that was a fair way to approach this. So I was looking for something smaller and more consistent in size, uh, and which would reflect differences within large areas like that. Okay, so now we had zip codes with um, uh, the block uh, data and the FHSZ data attached, aggregated to zip codes, uh, took those and applied the 2010 block population figures to the more current 2017 um, ACS data to get more current numbers on the population. Uh, so disaggregation, reaggregation there. Um, and then I had to figure out like, okay, how do I like, how do I even like take, I had, to, I had to solve a few problems and this will come, this hopefully will make sense. So I made a, a half mile buffer around every zip code uh, in order to overlay with neighboring zip codes because what I wanted to know was how every zip code compared to its neighbor. Uh, I wanted to know, was there more of a population living in the high risk area in one, in its neighbor uh, than in itself, right? That seemed like it was important uh, because for this analysis, we wanted to know what it looked like in terms of roads leading out of every area, but also we needed to know if those roads leading out led to an area that was in all likelihood a higher risk area because you know, at the end of the day, what I ended up doing was using both of those, both the number of roads leaving any zip code, but also the number of roads leaving leaving a zip code which did not go into an area that had a higher risk um, population. Okay, so and now I now have all these boundaries, these uh, buffers, um, and uh, needed to dedupe um, a lot of that. And then I brought in the open street maps roadways, and uh, it worked relatively well, um, you know, about as good as I could expect. Um, so took all of California and used just uh, highways, trunk roads, primary and secondary roads, left out some of those small roads and uh, ran an intersect with all those buffers. And then from there, it was uh, just a matter of kind of doing some math, not basic math, but basic math um, with the, with all of that data, which would now be combined in there, right? So you're talking about essentially 
the units at that point were the buffers themselves and and attached to that you had population data, fire risk data, um, and uh, roadway data uh, within those buffers. Uh, also, what, what was useful was that the different roadway types have standard lane counts. So we took those and we figured out essentially <clears throat> the number of people in every zip code which are in high risk divided by the number of lanes leaving and also leaving which are not going to higher risk areas. Um, and we had populations both total and living in that highest risk designation. What did we get? Anybody here from California? Okay, cool. Um, you guys see anything here that uh, sticks out or looks familiar? I mean, some of this stuff was like, that makes sense. Other of this was like, wow, I didn't realize that. You know, like Highland Park, I would not have guessed um, if you're familiar with that area. Uh, but there are some other places like Jamul, uh, which is on the edge of San Diego County. Um, also in Northern California, you see Megalia and Paradise, which are two neighboring cities. They were at the very top of kind of our rankings. Um, but a lot of other places, I think I think maybe one of the most important for for me for a variety of reasons was South Lake Tahoe. Um, you know, it's it's a pretty substantial community. It's also a pretty substantial tourist destination. Uh, and you know, when you really looked at it and thought about the worst case scenario, uh, it it's it could be really bad. Uh, Big Bear. Um, Minnalusa and Sugarloaf, which are the three areas that people just refer to as Big Bear, also kind of sitting there waiting to, for a worst case scenario, it could be really bad. Uh, the Scripps Ranch area in San, around San Diego, that's like Jamul, uh, kind of there's these areas, Ramona, around the San Diego area, which are, um, you know, pretty bad areas. And they've also had similar problems. Uh, 2007, the Harris Fire, there were also people who died in their cars trying to leave. So on the one hand, it was encouraging from a data statistics standpoint to see that, you know, some of these places that were coming up in our analysis had already experienced some of the problems we were trying to trying to analyze here, um, you know, but it also this is a pretty macabre topic. Um, one of the interesting places here is um, Rancho Palos Verdes in Los Angeles. Anybody <laughs> familiar with that area? It's like this like super wealthy like little peninsula that sticks out of like the Long Beach, Los Angeles area, like, and it overlooks the ocean. It's got these beautiful cliffs and million dollar homes. And like, it would be really, really bad if that, um, if they had a, a bad fire there. And in fact, there was some historic, uh, there's some really great historic uh, fire GIS files out there. And you can go all the way back to like 1910 and see all of the wildfires in California. And uh, prior to it being developed in that little peninsula, there had been a bunch of fires all the way, you know, especially in the 1950s and 1960s while there were, you know, people that were definitely living in Los Angeles, but that was not quite as developed. Um, not so much since like the 1980s when they really developed it all out. Um, but nonetheless, uh, they have this problem of population per lanes of egress. Uh, so what did we do with this? Um, we reported it. Um, Megan Diskin was my reporting partner on this. She works at the Ventura County Star. Uh, she went out into some of these communities, talked with community leaders, talked with emergency service officials, talked with residents. Uh, this here is a guy who um, lost his home in the Malibu area to a wildfire. The Malibu area and that kind of edge of Los Angeles to the north is like just really you know, got a lot, got a lot of risk. Uh, if you want to see the reporting that we did, you can see it right there, that bit.ly link. Uh, I'm certainly very proud of the work that we did. Uh, also, we mapped it, right? Um, because why not? So let's take a look at that. So here's kind of what we got. Um, this is that area that I was talking about there. Um, Ranchos Palos Verdes and Rolling Hills Estates. Uh, so, you know, if they if they had the worst case scenario there, you know, a lot of this stuff, once we once we were really looking at it, it makes sense when you pull up the roads. Uh, I really liked this base map. Have you guys seen this before? This is Stamen's uh, toner map. Uh, it kind of highlights main roads. Uh, so it, it was pretty nice, works pretty well. Um, I'll show you just some of these areas that I was talking about also. Over here, this is the you know outskirts of the San Diego area. 
Um, I've also got the uh, the fire hazard severity zone map that you can turn on and off. It's pretty faint, so I'll just leave it off. Uh, so that's the San Diego area. Um, here's the area up around Big Bear that is pretty bad. Um, and this is essentially a core pleth just of uh, the the rankings of the of the population in the highest risk per lane of traffic. There's actually some really interesting uh, things that popped up here in the outskirts of um, kind of Oakland, Berkeley area. Um, and then these um, these areas in the Sierra Nevadas, kind of predictably, uh, you know, narrow roadways leaning leaning in and out, um, and uh, real high risk areas. And then it looks like my internet is not loading a lot of stuff up here. Let me see if I can, oh, there we go. Um, so some other interesting places that popped off to us, um, you know, that I was pretty interested in this list, these areas kind of that are built up around lakes. And normally you would think of like water, fire, that doesn't sound like it would happen at the same time. But, um, you know, you've got dense communities living right around those lakes. And a lot of times they're very wooded, which is great conditions for a fire. And, um, and of course, here's the Paradise Megalia area right there. Um, and then some of these areas up here, just not very populated, but very high risk just because of the wooded areas. So let me jump back into here. Um, results, things we saw. Uh, we saw, you know, a lot of clicks. That's kind of how we measure success in the media world. Um, Hopefully that, you know, leads to education or outrage. Um, we also saw some policymakers talking about our work um, in South Lake Tahoe after Paradise happened. They got pretty serious about at least putting some effort and some thought and some public discussion into this matter. And we know for a fact that uh, our reporting helped spur that. Um, we also talked to emergency responders um, who have, uh, you know, given more thought to this, um, this topic, uh, this California legislators have also at least paid some lip service to maybe making some changes to the laws. Uh, they had done this in the nineties. They made, they made some requirements about, uh, the number of roadways leading into new developments. But by that time, there's a lot of already, you know, very dangerous places, uh, that were already developed. Um, still waiting to see, uh, this is the first fire season since we did this. And, you know, I've got a question about where we write, are we going to see this happen again? Again, uh, it's a weird position to be in where you're predicting very terrible outcomes and looking to see if they happen. Um, but that's for me to deal with. Um, we haven't seen real firm policy commitments just yet. Uh, improvements. Um, what would be really great would be if we had had actual lane counts for the roads and not just the standard number of lanes per roadway type. Um, uh, and then now just pie in the sky stuff, you know, like it would be cool if we could figure out a way to do um, route generation, um, optimal route generation for any given person or small communities, uh, or even on the fly changes to road closure, uh, based on road closure statuses. Um, and that's all I've got. I think I actually pulled this off in under 20 minutes. Um, I want to make sure I've got some credits in there for those folks who, uh, definitely helped out with this and, uh, you can reach me at any of these ways. Uh, you guys have any questions or thoughts or concerns? Did I get something wrong? And did you guys see a better way to do something we were trying to do? Do you, uh, have suggestions, questions, jokes, anything? It's getting late in the day. No? Yeah. Totally. So, uh, maybe like a network analytics type thing where you're just looking at cost savings or, you know, Yeah. So, one thing we, we had gone to a, a university of, oh shoot, now I'm looking real bad because I can't remember. Uh, well, we went to some researchers who have been working on that part of this equation yeah. and we asked them to produce for us a couple of like um, test cases and it really took them a lot longer than would have been feasible for us to deal with to produce those for us and then when they did um, like the the kind of stats that they were spitting out didn't look to us to be like I don't know there wasn't a whole lot there that we could work with um, so we we just didn't go that way but I'm eager to see if like there's continued research in that area anybody else 
We got a good joke? I've got one. Do you guys, oh yeah, no, go. Yeah. I'll, you wait for it. Okay. Not a joke. Um, <laughs> a so like you mentioned, you want to compare with the neighboring sex track and yeah. like buffer reduce. Just a little bit more on that. Like what exactly are you comparing? And why do you do the buffer? Um, so there may be a better, a better method to do this. Uh, cause I'm not a cartographer. Um, but basically I took, I, I needed the information out of each of those neighboring zip codes, uh, to compare with an, with the neighboring zip code. So what I did was make the buffer so that it would give me uh, essentially, um, uh, what's the right word I'm looking for? Uh, it's not a union. It's a, uh, yeah, essentially join, join the data from those two areas. Um, and I also needed it to just be a, a thin area for when I was going to bring in the roadways to do an intersect there as well. Yeah. All right. Did you guys hear the one about the pirate movie? It was rated R. <laughs> All right. Uh, any other questions, thoughts, concerns, jokes? All right. Cool. Thanks for being here. <laughs>